Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to Room by Room, the Home Organisation Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with expert knowledge from professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's get started. Hi everyone, and welcome back to the show. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about getting your affairs in order with Kate Hufnagel, who is an estate and digital organizer. Hi. Hello, Gabriella. Um, So how are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. We're getting ready for a winter storm here uh, to arrive probably in a few hours. (laughs) Okay. Hopefully, uh, we'll get everything done before then. Um, So do you mind, um, you know, introducing yourself a little bit better for the audience? Sure, absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm Kate Huffnagel. I am a professional organizer based in the United States of America, specifically in the state of Colorado, home to the Rocky Mountains and lots of wildlife. I got married for the first time just a few months ago at the age of 48. I'm a bonus mom of two young adults and love the outdoors and travel. About a year and a half ago, I left the corporate world after spending 25 years in high-tech fields like software development, and artificial intelligence, and I started my own business called The Digital Wrangler. I focus on helping individuals organize their affairs so that when the inevitable happens, they leave behind their greatest legacy, a well-organized estate. I also help people with their devices, whether it's overflowing inboxes, can't find electronic files, too many notifications, not enough storage, and I work with them to help them figure out the best way to use their devices and organize their information in a way that works best for them. Gabriella, thank you so much for welcoming me. I'm excited for our conversation today. Yeah, I'm very excited. I think that this is um, a really important topic that we don't often get to talk about. I think people are a bit scared about that. But before we dive into the topic. Um, We're going to get to know you a little bit better with a section we like to call, Have You Met Kate? Um, So our first question is, what's your favorite book? Oh, that's really a tough one. I'm a pretty avid reader. Um, I even worked in my small hometown library when I was in high school. Um, So I think I would answer it in, in, in this way. I tend to read for three different reasons. Um, first is for entertainment. Um, the last book I read, I just um, actually read it about a week ago, was called The Family Game by Katherine Stedman. It's like the psychological thriller. It was so captivating that I pretty much read it in a weekend. Um, I also read for like growth. Um, so books like Brene Brown's Rising Strong, Melissa Urban's book on boundaries, Joe Do- Doer's um, Measure What Matters, really awesome books. And then the third reason I read is for research. Um, And fun fact, I'm taking a break from work-related research books right now. And I am surrounded with a pile of books on Australia because my husband and I are hoping to come visit um, in about uh, 16, 18 months time. How long are you going to be in Australia for? Well, we've never been, and I keep telling him that I would really want to stay for like three weeks so we can try and see as much as we can see. Uh, next year, I'm turning the big five O, so I really want to kind of go on a big trip and explore and see as much of the country as possible. And it is a pretty big trip down here. I don't think people realize, but um, often when we travel, half of it is just leaving Australia. <laughs> um <laughs> particularly because I'm in Melbourne. So you have to travel all the way across the island first. So three weeks, I would say, is almost the minimum. (laughs) (laughs) I will keep that in mind. Maybe I can Mm -hmm. get him to take another week off from work. (laughs) Yep. And you may as well come down to New Zealand as well while you're here. That's what I keep telling him. (laughs) 
Well, he'll have to listen to the podcast and he'll know that an Australian said that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what about a movie you've enjoyed recently? Oh, well, you know, to be honest with you, I've been more on a TV series and documentary kick lately. Um, so a TV series that I'm actually really enjoying is Abbott Elementary. It is just one of these short sitcoms that just makes me laugh. Um, and a recent documentary I watched was called um, Trust No One. It's about a young CEO of a cryptocurrency exchange. And in my world of digital organizing, not to mention my high-tech background, I was fascinated by the technical aspects that go into cryptocurrency and blockchains, um, how they're some of the most secure trans transactions out there. Um, but it also had like a conspiracy theory undercurrent. Um, and I just found it all very riveting. That sounds good. And it's good to know, I guess, that coming from your background, it is something that you were, you learned something from, but also that um, was interesting for you. Yeah, sure thing. That's mm -hmm. that, that, you know, whether it's reading or podcasting or watching TV, I'm a big learner. So I always just mm -hmm. love to learn something. Mm. And what about podcasts? Are you listening to any at the moment? Um, of course I am. <laughs> um, so Jen Hatmaker has a podcast called For the Love. And last month she wrapped up a series of podcasts called What If. So she talked about like these like big provocative questions like what if um, I had a side hustle, right? What if I, you know, did this passion project? What if I started taking karate? Um, and I just found it just to be very inspirational and, um, and motivating. I just like love kind of pontificating those big questions. Um, and my friend, uh, Stephanie, um, Derringer, uh, just launched a podcast, um, at the start of this year, it's called Organized and Productive. And her podcast is a little unique. She focuses on this like symbiotic relationship between organization and productivity. And um, so I think that's really in interesting because I haven't heard a lot of people talk about that. And then when I'm on the treadmill and I just want to be entertained, I listen to some to a podcast called Smartless, it's hosted by like three Hollywood actors, and they'll have guests on like Steven Spielberg and or you know Kate Winslet, and they just they just share stories. And um, sometimes I have to be careful because the guys who are hosting it are really funny, mm -hmm. and so once or twice I've had to like grab onto the treadmill to make sure that I don't fall over from laughing. <laughs> That's the best sign of a podcast though. Like if something's really funny, you just completely lose control of, and doesn't matter what's around you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I'm definitely noticing a theme with um, what you read, watch and listen to <laughs> entertainment, but also learning, which is really great. Yeah. I don't know. Have you ever done the, um, oh, I don't, I think it's by Gallup, the smart find or uh, the strength finder. Um, like assessment or any of their books. Well, before I left corporate America, um, I at one point I had like over a hundred people working for me, and I took this leadership course. And the whole concept of this book or mindset called the Strength Finder is figuring out what your strengths are, and so that you can like leverage them, so that you can be more successful in the workplace or in life. And it really breaks down that mindset, especially someone like me. You know, I started working in the corporate field in the 90s, and those annual performance reviews were typically like, oh, well, you need to go take a training class on to become a better presenter or, you know, to write, to write better, whatever that means. Um, so I love this book because it says, you know what, forget about your weaknesses. You are who you are. So let's figure out your strengths and let's figure out a way to leverage them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I'll have to have a look at that. Um, I'd like to learn what my strengths are. I know all my weaknesses. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, right? Like we should know our strengths, right? Mm -hmm. Because they can then be 
we can leverage them more. And if we know what they are, we can then inform those that we interact with, whether it's our mm. family or our friends or our colleagues, and they can help us then grow and enhance those strengths. Yeah. So do you have a role model? Oh my gosh, so many. Um, I mean, there's like the standard answers, right? Like trailblazers and pioneering women like Oprah and Madeleine Albright, who I did have the great honor of hearing speak um, a few years back. Um, but there's like people in my everyday life, like my mom, you know, she took a break from her career uh, to raise us kids. You know, she re-entered the workspace many years later. Um, you know, my sister did a lot of work with local communities uh, through something called AmeriCorps, uh, where it's basically more of like a dedicate one to two years of serving communities across the United States. Um, and then she moved to a different state when her um, child was eight weeks old to start a PhD. I mean, I, I just have all these amazing women in my life, so I don't have to look very far to find inspiration. That's so good. That's a, that's great. Yeah. And I think having the women in your life really show you um, what you can do is such a, a benefit, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And has there, have you done a course that's inspired you? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I touched on the Strength Finder, which was kind of a the foundation for a week long like leadership course that I took. Um, but I will tell you, um, last year when I walked away from corporate America, just to kind of give myself some space to figure out what I wanted to do, I did actually step into the classroom as a substitute teacher. I don't know if Australia has the similar concept, um, but if it, you know, a teacher's out sick or they're, you know, taking a little trip or something, they'll call in a substitute. Um, so I will say that there is nothing like having 30 teenagers in a classroom and having to keep them engaged and motivated, um, especially because I just focus usually on math classes. Um, so it really taught me how to like flex my improv skills for sure. I can't imagine anything harder than trying to get a bunch of teenagers to like sit down and do maths. <laughs> I, I completely agree. I mean, algebra and calculus and um, yeah, <laughs> I, I've learned an awful lot uh, about myself and mm -hmm. um, about teenagers and this new generation that's coming up um, as well. Yeah, that'd be really interesting to to see what has happened in the last few years. And um, yeah, that'd be interesting to see. Um, so how would you define home organization? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, and preparing for for this interview or, you know, discussion, um, obviously I've been listening to a number of Room by Room um, podcasts, and I really was fascinated about the conversation you had with Reverend Dr. Joseph Ferrari, because he talked about that definition of home and how everyone has a different definition. Um, so I would say that I have two answers um, from the perspective of the digital and estate organizing. So based on my digital organizing work, I would define home organization with this question. Are you using your device or devices in a way that serves you best? And then from an estate organization perspective, I would um, ask the question, you know, will your loved one or loved ones be able to access your devices and easily find like the bills that you've been paying and things of that nature? Yeah, I don't think, at least in my household, no. <laughs> so yeah, those are the questions that you need to be asking. Um, interesting. Uh, what are some misconceptions about them? Well, I think the basic assumption is that like, quote unquote, magic happens, right? No, you know, none of us took a class, say, on how to use our phone 
or how to buy something off of Amazon, right? It's just assumed that you figure it out, right? Um, and when it comes to digital organization, your digital world, your digital so-called clutter isn't, it's not visible like physical clutter, right? You, If you walk into a garage or a closet or a pantry and it's cluttered, you see that. But with a device, you know, you could be sitting next to someone who's on their device, whether it's a laptop or a phone, and you really have no idea what the contents sort of speak of their phone, you know, look like. Right? We assume that because pretty much everyone these days is using a device of some sort and using technology, that we assume that everyone just knows how to keep their digital stuff organized. <laughs> And we and we don't. <laughs> mm. Yes, I can say I, I don't think I have the perfect organization system. But then when I look at my partner's phone, I can't even I, I can't do it. <laughs> I'm it's the same just, way when I look at my husband's. I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, isn't that like that gives me anxiety. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, he doesn't have his I can't find anything on his phone. So um, that's probably just different styles of organization, though. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so I guess you've talked about digital clutter and how it's hard to to know what's on there. But like, I imagine that's like stuff like, you know, um, f photos and music. What is digital clutter? Like, oh, well, I would say in the purest sense, like if we're going to take an analogy from like the physical clutter and apply it to the digital world, um, it could pertain to having too many photos and videos. It could mean that you have more apps on your phone um, or your tablet, you know, that you need, right? Because sometimes, you know, we'll download an app and it serves us well and then we get distracted because there's now another new app, right? Another new shiny object. Um, but it can also mean, and maybe this is more so from like a work place perspective um but in the in the there could be a lot of like electronic files and how do you organize those in a way that you can find what you need with ease um and hopefully ease also has some aspect of speed right because if we are spending an hour trying to track down a document um, it's like spending an hour rummaging through our sock drawer or a closet trying to find that, you know, pair of pants. Um, so there's so many different aspects to digital clutter. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. And so you also mentioned um, not just digital clutter, but in the in in the terms of estate planning. So how do they, I guess, how do they interact? What What is the uh, influence of each other? Okay. Well, I heard you say, Gabriella, that, you know, you have, in some form or fashion, you have access to your partner's phone. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's terrific, right? Because heaven forbid, you know, something happens to your partner, you at least can get to his phone, right? So much of our lives today is on our phone. We pay bills with our phone, we check email, we have our social accounts, we maybe stream Netflix on our phone. So there's that aspect of the access to the device. Um, and then there's the other aspect of, okay, everything that makes up your life, Gabriella, you know, I'm just going to assume that you have like the proper legal documents that you need to say, okay, so-and-so is going to take, is going to be responsible for my stuff if something happens to me, um, or even just paying all of your bills, right? Because just because something happens to you doesn't mean those bills go away. Uh, so making sure that people understand, one, that this is kind of the scope of having things organized for your person. Um, 
And also included with that, like in today's world, we've got, you know, email and social media, uh, streaming services. Those didn't exist even 10, 15 years ago. And so those are a lot of things that kind of get overlooked. And and then all of just the other things, right? Like if you are taking all those photos and videos and you're pushing them up to, to your cloud account, right? They may not be worth money, but those are memories that more than likely your loved one is going to want to access um, should something happen to you. Hmm. So what can we do to, you know, if something happened to me today or tomorrow, or hopefully not for a long time, but all of my bills up, I pay all the bills um, at the moment. Um, and so it's all under my name. And what happens, I guess, how should I go about making sure that my partner can access everything um, if something happens? Well, if you... Um... I don't know, are kangaroos dangerous? I just want to come up with some like a silly scenario. Like you get hit yes, by a they kangaroo. Are. They okay, are. So if you... you get into a fight with them, you can die. Ooh. Okay. Well, I don't wish that on you. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I do like kind of talking about like using like crazy scenarios because it does sometimes make it easier for people to talk about this topic. Um, so let's just say it's Gabriella versus kangaroo and kangaroo wins. Mm-hmm. What I would encourage you to think about is, um, and it's the same in my household, I'm in charge of household operations, as I call it. So I have a list of all the bills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many of them these days have an online account. So I make sure that my person has access and or knows like the password to all of those accounts. So it's not only just understanding those bills, but then I all, you also need to make sure that your person has access and the legal authority to say access your bank accounts, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't want them to get in trouble if they don't have that legal authority to say, go into you and access your bank account. Um, so I work with some people who do prefer the paper route when it comes to this sensitive information. Those individuals tend to be a little bit older than me. Um, for people like more my peer group and younger, um, they'll either have like a spreadsheet listing all of that important information that they then share um, with you know, I call it the with their person or their loved ones. Um, and some people will use, say, like a online password manager that securely like, you know, locks up all of those passwords. And what's really neat about the password about most password managers is they'll let you share all those passwords with whoever you want to share them with. It does seem particularly the uh, spreadsheet route. It seems like it could be very easily hacked. Is that something that people worry about? Well, that's a really fascinating question. And it's all about like working with the individual based on their comfort level, right? So if you're having a spreadsheet, say on your laptop, let's say, right? Your laptop probably has a password mm -hmm. and you could password protect that spreadsheet as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, or you could potentially put that spreadsheet in a cloud, right? But if you're trusting your cloud account with all of your other information, then why can't you trust the cloud to hold on to this spreadsheet? Um, the other reason why some people prefer using a spreadsheet or even like a Word document is that they don't have to really like pay for that. Right. Mm. Some password managers, that's yet another monthly bill. Um, and then there are even some tools out there that um, you could upload all of your data to, like a copy of, say, like your will and your medical information and all of your financial information. Um, and yet that comes with another bill. And some people are comfortable basically giving 
literally all of their personal information to a third party. Mm. Um, so it's just about finding like what are people comfortable with. Uh, so in my mind, as long as you have a list of the accounts and the passwords, whether that's paper copy or you're storing it on your personal device locally or you're using a cloud or a third party, to me, that becomes a secondary conversation. The mm -hmm. most important part is just making sure you have that information available and that your person knows where to find it. Mm -hmm. I definitely remember as a kid, my mom always saying, all of the passwords, if something happens to me, all the passwords are in this filing cabinet. And I'm like, yeah, mom, whatever. <laughs> well, let me tell you a story. My um, mm -hmm. One of my parents, my parents are both alive. Um, they're in their mm -hmm. early 80s. And over the summer, one of them had a, a medical emergency. So I had, and they live um, outside New York City. So I had flown um, to um, help the other, you know, to help them out. Um, I was in a position where I could do so. My two siblings, um, you know, had some jobs and they couldn't, you know, take a month off from work that I wound up taking. And my parents um, carry around those little paper, like address books, but they use it for their passwords <laughs> and they've been telling me for years that they've had that they've had everything or everything is organized kate we are all set well my mother didn't realize until my father was in the hospital and she wanted to pay some bills that he had written down all the passwords and code oh no she didn't know what the code was oh no and thank like i said thankfully he is he's fine um mm -hmm. he's probably hasn't hasn't been this this strong and buff in a number of years um <laughs> but they learned a lesson there in in the span of about two or three days yeah <laughs> oh that'd be so stressful very much so actually so I guess what can happen if you aren't organized? Um, obviously, it can be very stressful for the family, but um, I guess what are some other scenarios? Oh, well, I've got so many stories that I could share with you. So let me see if I can narrow it down to two or three. Um, well, in December, oh, I, <clears throat> excuse me, in December, I um, actually was paying a visit to my doctor and um, I love my doctor. He's really cool. And we were just, you know, sh shooting the breeze. And I was telling him about my new business. And he actually had to sit down. And I could tell, like, he was clearly moved about something. And he went on to tell me that his best buddy, probably a year or two ago, had tragically lost his wife. And the wife, similar to you and me, Gabriella, right, we handle all of the bills um, for our household. And she did every bill electronically, right? So mm -hmm. years ago, we would get a paper bill in the mail, in the mailbox. And so at least if that would be a, a cue or a reminder to somebody like, oh, I've got to figure out how to pay this bill. Well, my doctor's best buddy had no access to his wife's email. He had no idea what bills were being paid. And it was probably about five or six months after she passed that he realized that he had not been paying the electricity bill when the electric, the electricity to their house was cut off. Ooh. Right, so like that's, that's one story. Um, I have another friend um who a little bit older than me and she had some time to prepare she like her mother had been sick and so it wasn't a surprise unlike uh that my doctor's story and so she had some time to work with her mom to you know kind of get everything kind of buttoned up a little bit and organized um, and then what she realized after the fact was it was a few things, actually. This is a good story for a few reasons. Um, one, she immediately shut off her mother's cell phone because she didn't want to pay the bill, right? Mm -hmm. And how many banks do you know? Like if you're, say, logging in from a new computer, they'll send you a text message to verify that you are who you are. So mm -hmm. she lost that ability. So that created some challenges. Um, it turns out 
At least she strongly suspects that her mother had an email account that she never told her mm. daughter about. Um, so when she was trying to like click the link to reset a password, that link wasn't coming to the email account that she knew about. Mm -hmm. Um, so that created some additional challenges. And then the last thing, which I think really just goes to show the power of social media and emphasizes really where we are in the digital age, you know, she, she eventually managed her way through all of those challenges. But the one thing that she still cannot resolve almost two years later is getting access to uh, her mother's Facebook account. Mm -hmm. And Facebook has, just like all platforms, right? Facebook has a very robust privacy policy, right? We love it, right? That's why it's probably like the number one social media platform out there. Um, we can post on Facebook and we tell Facebook, okay, I only want my friends to see this post or I only want like four of my besties to see this meme that I'm posting or I want to post this and I want everyone on Facebook to be able to see it, right? So mm -hmm. Facebook follows what we tell Facebook we want and we love it when we're alive, but when we're no longer that privacy policy from Facebook still applies. They're not giving access to anybody. They're not going to give anyone access to um, an account unless you tell Facebook ahead of time. And my um, girlfriend didn't know about this, so she didn't instruct her mom on, on, to, on what to do. Um, so Facebook does have a feature called Legacy um, Contact. So you can go into your settings and you can specify, hey, I want, you know, my husband or my BFF or my sister um, or my son or daughter to have access to my account, you know, after I pass. If you don't do that, then there's no, there's really no way that Facebook is going to give access to anybody. Okay. So... There was I a mean, lot what if, there to unpack. That's so. a lot. There's a lot there to think about. <laughs> I guess. Can what if you just leave your Facebook, like your email address and your password? Is that enough, or do you still have to specify someone? Well, so you you can, right? Facebook isn't going to know any better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, banks and more, like I'll say, I'll put in air quotes, more important accounts are mm -hmm. eventually going to learn. Um, that you have passed. Um, Facebook may not necessarily, you know, learn that, but some people don't want to give up their passwords either. Mm. Right. So uh, that's one thing that, um, like I said, my, uh, this girlfriend of mine, um, even almost two years after her mom passed, she still cries about it because the, she'll get like those Facebook memories mm. that will pop up from say like her mom's account and she's just like it's like my mother is passing away all over again it's been a really emotional experience for her uh, and there's not much that she can do about it so i guess now that we know that this is a thing that you we can nominate other people to be able to control our facebook account after we've passed what other things like how can we try to i guess troubleshoot these before this happens should we do a practice run are there is there a list that we can go through uh interesting well so i call it the big three mm -hmm. so if you have an apple device um apple also has a legacy contact feature um, i already mentioned facebook and google does as well, though Google calls um, their feature an inactive account manager. Mm -hmm. um, the Apple and the Facebook legacy contacts are really easy to set up. It should take like maybe even under two minutes to say, I'm just, you know, designating so and so to, you know, have access to my account. Um, Google's inactive account manager is extremely robust. And that's because Google is collecting a lot of our data, 
right? It's and mm-hmm. so Google allows you to specify even by data set what person you want to have access to. So if you just think about Google for a minute, um, I think it's 20 or 30 different data sets. So for instance, email is one. Um, mm-hmm. Google owns YouTube. So if you are a content creator on YouTube and you want, say, let's just say my sister, I want to give my sister access to my YouTube channel, um, I can give her access to just my YouTube channel and I can give access to all my other data sets to somebody else. So Google's inactive account manager takes a little bit longer to set up simply because you can go to that level of granularity of what data set or data sets you want someone to access. And they also ensure that um, they have like my contact information. So like Google, um, like I have a personal Google account. I have a work Google account. Um, I had to add like my primary email. I added like a backup email address and I even gave them my cell phone number. They're going to make attempts to contact me multiple times through multiple means. Mm -hmm. And after a certain time period that Google lets the individual specify, then they're going to start reaching out to your inactive account managers. And then you have to give Google contact information for your inactive account managers. You can see how this like starts to get a little bit more complex in the world of Google. Um, Mm. But still like these are things Gabriella that you know people don't know it kind of goes back to my earlier comment you know like no one trained us on these things right we're just expected to know them Mm -hmm. like even my mom who is very prepared she's got all of the you know she's she told us where her will is um she said uh this is where all the medical stuff is these are all my passwords for all the banking but i don't think she's got her facebook password anywhere um <laughs> <laughs> like i would i wouldn't know what to do there um you know she's sticky taped um a key to her safe somewhere so i know exactly where it is but her social medias, I have, I have no idea. I have no idea about her email passwords. So I'm going to have to have this conversation with her, but it seems a little bit morbid, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. To some people. And this is why Mm. it is, um, it is a challenge to educate people in this arena. Mm -hmm. Um, because some people consider this topic to be a little taboo. Mm -hmm. Um, Other people think that, oh, I don't have to worry about that today. It's not important. Um, And other people are just like, I'm too young, right? I don't don't need to worry about these things right now. Talk to me in 50 years. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, You know, but Unfortunately, and I, maybe it's just because I live in here in Colorado, where we have a we've got a number of adre- adrenaline junkies that live in in Colorado, um, <laughs> and and I just have just know too many sad, tragic stories of you know young people in particular who never really gave any thought to these things. Uh, and you know the research shows that it takes on average at least here in the states it takes on average almost 600 hours to settle someone's estate and the estate attorneys and the financial advisors that i've been talking with over the last year are actually indicating that that number is outdated and is low simply because the technology piece is making things more complicated after someone passes away. Mm -hmm. Tech tech is great when we're alive. It makes our lives easy. I can order something from Amazon just by opening up the app on my phone and it's on my doorstep within Mm -hmm. a day usually. Um, But after when we're not around or even if, you know, we're just hospitalized and we can't communicate, Mm-hmm. Um, 
it just creates a lot of challenges for people. Mm. So I guess what, when should we start thinking about this? Should we, should we go home now after this episode and start thinking about this? Um, well, of course I want to advocate for that. <laughs> um, but even if you just do a simple, you know, you start small, right? Mm -hmm. If, if, a, if one of your loved ones or the person that you would want to, you know, be in charge of your, of your, all of your stuff, um, physical and digital after you pass, you know, just make sure that, you know, they can get into your phone. Right. Whether that means you're giving them the password or you're telling them where they can find the password, or maybe you even take the step of the next time you see that individual, you're programming their fingerprint or, or their face into your phone. Um, last month, I was in um, New Jersey visiting some family and friends, and um, we got together with uh, friends of my husband's who I had not met before. And one of them was telling the story of how one of his coworkers a couple of months prior had to go into a funeral home and beg the owner to have access um, to the individual's body so that they can get the fingerprint and unlock that person's phone because no one oh. had the password to it. So... To me, if you can have someone just share, like share the access information, right? Mm -hmm. Up to up to you as an individual, whether you actually want to program their face or just tell them where they can find the password. I think that is a really important thing um, that that someone can do. Mm -hmm. I think the more challenging part is having that conversation with your person because it's it's hard to kind of like talk about the uncomfortable right mm. um so even if you can just even start the conversation and just because it's a serious topic doesn't mean that the conversation has to be serious right it could be mm. like oh well you know when you know, when, when I am fighting the kangaroo and the kangaroo wins or I get hit by the ice cream truck, mm -hmm. um, you know, like here's where's my, here's where, you know, where my stuff is. Here's where you can find my important information. Here's where I keep my passwords. Mm -hmm. um, just even if you can move that conversation forward one inch in whatever that looks like for, for you, um, then I feel like you're making progress in that space. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned before that um, technology has made it a lot harder to, yeah, like it, it's made it a lot harder to get our affairs in order because there's so many different things that we have to think about now. But can we use technology to make it easier as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, like I mentioned, like password managers is a really mm -hmm. easy way for people to very securely, you know, share passwords. So if if you don't want to carry around your little black book of passwords where they're mm -hmm. all written in paper, right? Because if you lose that book, you know, then what happens? Uh, and, you know, creating a, a some sort of electronic, you know, document that some that your loved ones can access um, and that more importantly they know how to access it if you're not around to help them find it um, and there are some tools out there um like ever plans and trustworthy at least in the united states where you can upload all of that you know data and then give permission to family members or loved ones to access all of that data. So there's a wide range of tools that can help. And it just boils down to, you know, what is the individual most comfortable using? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's good that there are lots of different options, not just one. Because I imagine that some of the more technological ones would be harder for people who aren't so tech savvy. 
Oh, absolutely. Right. And this is this is kind of that, you know, we're in the world of the digital age. Right. Mm -hmm. You can find an app for anything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, whether it's, oh, you know, Sudoku. I mean, I think there's like a hundred Sudoku apps out there. Um, And and the same applies when it comes to this. Right. There's so many options uh, that sometimes the hardest part is just figuring out what option makes best sense for you and your situation. Um, So is there anything that I've missed that you wanted to talk about? That's a good question. Um, From an estate organizing perspective, I I don't think so. I think we've touched on pretty much most of the, like I would say like the so-called big topics. Okay, great. Um, So I'll move on to the practice habit section. Okay, so um, what's a practice that you do to manage your own digital clutter? Oh, fascinating question, Gabriella. So one of the things that I do pretty regularly now, not in the beginning, um, was review and delete, say, digital photos. And did you know that the average person takes 20 photos a day with their phone? So that, like doing the math, that translates to like 600 a month and over 7,000 a year, Mm. right? Photos and videos, they take up a lot of, you know, storage space. And do you really need to hold on to every single photo? I'm going to wager a guess and say, probably not, Mm. (laughs) right? You take a screen grab of a meme that you sent your bestie, you know, last month, now in present day, doesn't have the meaning that it did right Mm -hmm. um so that is a practice that i have learned to help me manage one aspect of my digital clutter Mm. so how often should we do that well if you are like the average person and you're taking 20 photos a day um i would encourage you to at least go through that 600 like once a month (laughs) Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> because like, let, let's talk about like what happens to those photos, right? If you are taking all those photos and let's say they're going to your cloud account, mm-hmm. right? If they're going to your cloud account, you may, for, for many of those photos, you may never even look at them ever again, right? So do they ultimately really need to be going to your cloud account. And if you're taking 7,000 a year, at some point, you're going to be quote unquote forced to buy more storage because you have all of these photos. And I would argue that, I don't know, maybe half, you don't want to be holding on like forever. Mm. So, I developed um, a practice probably about a year ago where I started out just setting a timer and be like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to play a game with myself. Let's see how many, how many photos can I delete in one minute? And uh-huh. in the beginning, it was actually really hard because I was waiting for that timer to go off. <laughs> and I was like, I'm like, isn't it like, when is that minute up? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and eventually I worked up to the point where I would just, I would put on like one of my favorite songs, right? The songs usually like three, three and a half minutes. Mm-hmm. And I'll just sit there and I'll be like, okay, delete, delete, delete. Wait, why do I have five of the same photo? I'm going to at least delete those four, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of turn it into a little bit of a game. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now I'm at a point where I'll do that, you know, at a minimum for me, I'm doing it once a month. And um, I typically will do it when the house is quiet, right? When my my husband and my uh, bonus son, like maybe on the weekends while they're still sleeping in and I've got some quiet time or after my husband like leaves to go to his like physical office uh, or I'm having lunch and you know, taking, taking a break. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to put on a tune and I'm just going to delete, delete, delete. Um, 
just try and make it a little fun. Mm -hmm. I do that sometimes, mostly because I ran out of space on my phone. <laughs> my so I was like, I was like, I have to do this. So um, I mostly did it when I was on the train. Because what else are you doing on the train? Yeah. I mean, my dad, like in the 70s, 80s and 90s, like would commute and take the train into New York City. And I know he like did his crossword puzzle and he would prepare for his meetings. But in our digital age, mm -hmm. yeah, you could read a book and you, or you can spend two minutes deleting photos. Yeah. Except I always find something else to do on my phone, so I don't do it nearly as often, but I'm going to set a timer to do it now. <laughs> you would just, like I said, start with, you know, 30, 60 seconds and, mm -hmm. and you know, it's just building that ritual, building that practice. It does take a little intention, mm -hmm. but before you know it, you're going to, it's almost going to be, you know, automatic, you know, just like we brush our teeth or, you know, take the trash out, right? Those are like, I call these digital hygiene things of taking care of our digital photos. It's just like housekeeping that we do around our physical home. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. I'm definitely going to be doing that. I'll uh, set myself a, a timer. I'll do maybe one today. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, so we've also got some questions from the audience. Okay. So um, is there a right time to get our affairs in order um, or is it just the sooner the better? Well, I think it's an interesting question. Um, if, oh, I guess I have a couple of answers for this. <laughs> um, well, selfishly, um, a few years ago, I received a, di a medical diagnosis. Um, that was an impetus for me to get my own personal affairs in order. Um, and I knew I was going to have a very significant surgery. And so that was like my motivation. Mm -hmm. So I had some, I had a little bit of notice for something like that, right? Um, But most people, I guess in this instance, like that was a privilege that I had, right? I had some warning, um, mm -hmm. you know, life, life is short and, you know, the moment that we're born, you know, the circle of life for better, or for worse, we, we are going to pass away at some point, right? The unknown is we don't know when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So in terms of is there, you know, a better time? No, it's it's really going to boil down to when an individual is is ready to have those like big conversations with themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then also think about like, you know, their loved ones, right? Do they want to potentially leave things organized um, or at least in a better state than maybe where they might be today? Um, and this is where like I tell people like, your, you have the potential to leave behind your greatest legacy and that is making things as easy as possible for your loved ones. Um, and so I guess that's how I would talk about that question is kind of ask a question in return of, well, what, what do you want to leave behind for your loved ones? Mm. And I think that will help each listener figure out what makes best sense for them. And hopefully, um, you like your loved ones enough that you don't want to leave them a mess. Right. And and I would just, like I use this expression, like focus on the big rocks, right? Mm -hmm. Focus on the things that um, are going to have potentially like the, the biggest impact, right? Like mm -hmm. your legal documents, you know, maybe your medical information, your financial details, right? And if you can at least get those big rocks and you feel comfortable with that, 
then you maybe start to focus on some of the medium sized rocks, uh-huh. right? Because they can, I mean, in today's digital world, there's so many moving parts and pieces. Mm-hmm. And so like, what is most important, right? The, to me, the legal, financial and medical stuff tend to fall into that category. Uh, mm. Your Netflix password probably isn't the most important one. <laughs> No, but at some point, you know, that someone's got to be paying that bill. Even if you're Mm -hmm. not watching Netflix, Netflix is still going to take their money. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So our second audience question is, what kind of factors should we look at when selecting someone to trust with our affairs? Like, how do we pick our person? Oh, well, mostly I encourage people to talk to their estate attorney um with that question because that's it's so personal and there can be nuances associated with the law that you know the estate attorney is going to be you know much more versed in say than someone like me um i for instance actually have two people from a legal perspective um i have my my husband and one of my siblings Right. And and I chose to do that after talking with my estate attorney because she discovered that I love to travel. And a lot of the travel that I do is actually with my with my hubs. And so what if something happens to us while we're traveling or even if we're just driving across town to go out to dinner? Mm. Um, he and I do spend a lot of time together. So for me, it made sense to have another person um, but like legally designated um, and again it's it's such a personal conversation uh, that's why I, I encourage people to you know talk to to the attorney right there could be you could have minor children and so you want to make sure that one your attorney is ensuring that you have the proper paperwork uh, in place so that your children are cared for and it's possible that the person that you want to look after your children is totally different and you want a different person to manage your finances right so talking with an estate attorney can really help tease out all those different nuances of your unique and special life. Mm. I remember as a kid, um, reading about all the parents who always die before the beginning of a novel, um, like in Harry Potter. (laughs) And so asking my parents, what would happen to me if you died to my parents? (laughs) Which is not what I think my parents want to be thinking about. But um, yeah, you make a really great point that you spend a lot of time with your partner, your husband, your wife. Um, and so what happens to everything if both of, if something happens to both of you or what happens to your kids? And my parents did tell me, my aunt, we're going to my aunt. Uh, so that was a um, relief to me. <laughs> I'm not going to be um, left with my I guess my least favorite aunt and uncle, maybe like in Harry Potter. (laughs) Um, So that was, that was nice. Um, Actually, that brings me a question. Like, how do you talk to your kids about it? And especially like younger kids. Yeah. um, That's a really delicate, you know, topic. Um, I know for me, it was my parents. 20th it was either their 20th or their 25th anniversary and we had an aunt who lived in California so we all flew out to California and then my parents for their big anniversary celebration um, they were gonna fly on to Hawaii and we stayed then with you know my aunt and, and her family and I do remember that was really the first time that my parents said to us, oh, in sidebar, uh, my mother is not the biggest fan of flying. And so here she was, she was gonna have to 
not only fly, but fly over the ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do remember her telling us, okay, your father and I, we have updated all of our stuff. Um, I mean, I was in, I mean, I was maybe 12, I'm Mm -hmm. guessing. Um, And I'm the oldest, right? So like my, my kid sibling at that time then would have been like six. Um, So I don't remember if she sat us all down or if she just happened to say something to me since I was, since I'm the oldest child. Um, But I think she just presented it in a more lighthearted, you know, easygoing um, fashion Uh, because, you know, I feel like this younger generation today has in general, and, and I recognize I'm just making a broad statement, but they seem to have a little bit more like anxiety than I remember having at their age. Um, I have no idea if technology impacts or influences that at all. I, I really am hoping that there's some researcher out there looking at that. Um, and so I think it's just as the situ- as a situation potentially presents itself where it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be probably my best advice at, at, at this point in time. Um, mm-hmm. My bonus kids are now young adults um, and they have, you know, their own lives and their own accounts and their own financial responsibilities. So it does make it easier um, to have that conversation. Um, but there are a lot of people out there, like I said earlier, who just think it's very taboo and they don't want to talk about it. Uh, mm. So it's all about, you know, what what you're comfortable with. And even if it isn't easy, mm-hmm. sometimes you still just be, have to figure out a way to start that conversation, whether it's by telling a joke <laughs> or using analogies like, oh, I got into a fight with a kangaroo um, yep. <laughs> to make it a little bit more lighthearted. Mm-hmm. Or as I did, just um, bring it back to, to novels that I read as a kid. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so w- what are some things that people forget about? Um, so you mentioned sort of the big ones, but what are some things that people forget? Um, well, I'll ta- let's touch on cryptocurrency or and NFTs, right? mm-hmm. non-fungible tokens. Um, you know, I, the last thing that I was reading was that about 20% of like the world's population now has either invested in cryptocurrency or has purchased an NFT of some sort, right? A digital artwork, for lack of a better phrase. Mm-hmm. Well, there, those, are, those items are entirely 100% digital, right? And in theory, they're worth money. And in some cases, if you made some smart investments, it could be worth some, some sizable amounts of money and so how do you make sure that your loved ones are able to access that entirely digital asset when something happens to you so like cryptocurrency comes with a key um like a secure key it's kind of like a think of it as like a combination to a safe but it's usually a very long maybe 32 characters and a lot of gobbledygook right um and cryptos will either you'll either store that key in a cold wallet or a hot wallet meaning it's either connected online or it's saved maybe like on a jump drive or something like that so this comes back to uh, the advice I was giving in terms of having a list of like, say your bills. Well, you also need to have a list of your digital assets because they're entirely digital. No one's ever gonna know that you have them unless you tell them. So if you have invested money in these assets, I would assume that if something were to happen to you, you want somebody to have access to them because they're going to be worth 
potentially sizable amounts of money. Um, so I think crypto and NFTs are often overlooked. And another thing that maybe people don't know about is um, like customer loyalty programs, like airline miles or hotel points. If you read the terms of service, many of those companies, not all of them, but many of them will actually allow your hotel points or your airline miles to be transferred to somebody else. So for instance, um, if you have, oh, I don't know, say 600,000 points with Marriott, mm -hmm. um, that is equivalent to like over a month's worth of free hotel nights. Nice. Right. And, and yeah. so if you're if you're like digitally hoarding your hotel points or your airline miles, mm -hmm. um, they're actually worth something. And who wouldn't love to receive 30 free 30 hotel nights for free? Right. And and so that's something else that people don't tend to know about, um, mm. because who reads those terms of service agreements <laughs> when we <laughs> sign up for these things, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there's those are the those are some other aspects, um, and depending on how much crypto you own or how many airline miles that you have, those could be big rocks or they could be small rocks. Mm. It depends on the individual. It would be pretty nice to, I guess, receive. I mean, obviously it's a sad situation, but it would be nice to receive like a holiday from a from your partner if something happened. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know anyone who thinks that they that there would be no value in, in passing mm. that on, right? Oh here, go yeah. take a holiday. You know, go go visit a place that we talked about visiting that you know, you can still go without me. I want you to have a good mm. time. Yeah, that would be lovely, actually. Um, so we'll move on to our open mic section now. Um, so this is where you get to talk about something that you're passionate about, but it doesn't necessarily have to be related to our topic today. So did you okay. have uh, something that you wanted to talk about? Um, sure. I mean, we've been talking about some really, you know, personal and potentially, you know, difficult conversations. So I thought I would kind of continue that theme and talk about something that I don't typically talk about. <laughs> um, and that is this whole world of food allergies. Um, mm -hmm. I, gosh, it was probably 12 or 13 years ago now, um, I was at work on a usual Monday in October and was eating lunch uh, in the office and I went into anaphylactic shock with really no warning, no history of um, food allergies. And thankfully, there was uh, epinephrine nearby and I had to stab myself in the thigh and then I got a ride in an ambulance. Um, so that really changed my life, right? I had, you know, I was in my, you know, mid thirties. I suddenly found myself in a world where I wasn't prepared to like mentally or emotionally deal with this whole idea that food, like the fuel for our body could potentially kill me, quite frankly. Um, and so since then, I've become very passionate about reading labels on foods because manufacturers can change ingredients or change uh, the location, say, where they're um, creating, you know, my favorite snacks. Um, and I really am gravitating now towards brands uh, brands that are transparent about their food um, and the ingredients and even like manufacturing of, of food. Um, so if I find a label 
where a company is saying, okay, well, you know, this, this, I don't know, granola bar has these 10 ingredients and we're letting you know that it has, let's just say, you know, wheat and egg, right? Those are two of the big allergens. And then they, underneath that, go on to say, oh, well, it's also manufactured on the same lines uh, as, say, like tree nuts. Like, I just love that transparency. Um, my friend Col Colleen Cabanaugh, uh, who's based in San Francisco, she started a food company a few years back where she will take a QR code and put it on the outside of the packaging of the food. And you can scan that code to learn the test results of not only common food allergens like nuts and milk, um, but also she tests for over 400 chemicals and toxins. And I just love what she's doing of putting all of that information basically at the consumer's hand and using technology, quite frankly, to get that information out to people. Um, so my food allergy adventure um, still continues uh, mm -hmm. today, right? I have to be pretty relentless. Um, you know, I wear a medical alert bracelet. I carry epinephrine around. Um, but in recent years, I've also translated that into making sure that the personal care products that I use, like shampoo and sunscreen, um, I have really started to research those companies and research the ingredients that they're putting into those products. And it's also translated into like the cleaning products that we use in our home, making sure that, you know, we're not using toxic in, uh, ingredients for in those products as well. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So in Australia, I know that on our all of our labeling, it has to say if there are traces or if it's made on the same line as, you know, things like nuts and eggs. Is that not something that everywhere has? Oh, no. Um, speaking very candidly, the U.S. laws and regulations are a bit looser than mm -hmm. Australia and, and Europe. Um, in fact, just last month, sesame was added to the list for mandatory labeling. And I think uh, certainly in the EU, in the European Union, sesame has been on their list for many years. Um, so yeah, when it comes to like food and ingredients, there's a lot less regulation and requirements than uh, most other countries, which is really fascinating. That's, I mean, it's good to know, I guess, if I ever did go to the US, so I know what to look out for. Because um, in my own family, where we've been very lucky so far not to have any allergies or any major allergies, but my brother's fiance is allergic to nuts. So a huge thing that my family had to go through was to actually start reading all of those things and understand what it means. Because the worst thing that could happen is we accidentally kill her. Right. Well, I mean, I shouldn't. I mean, I shouldn't laugh, but yes. I mean, I'm I'm anaphylactic to peanuts, but I'm also anaphylactic to peas and lentils, which are very unusual. Um, mm. But from a like biological perspective, peanuts, peas and lentils are all legumes. Mm. Um, and so they're like somehow biologically or chemically like related. And so, you know, my doctors are just like, well, yeah, this actually does kind of make sense. And a legume allergy is more common than one might think. Uh, but yes, if you were to come to the United States, um, the good news is tree nuts, um, they have to be required um, to be labeled. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it's a, only if it's an ingredient, mm -hmm. it's up to the individual manufacturer to voluntarily disclose, okay, well, tree nuts are also present in the facility. There's no requirement for that. 
Um, so this is why in the in the United States, I seek companies out who actually voluntarily disclose information like that because I just appreciate them being open and transparent and then mm. letting me make that informed decision. Okay, do I want to buy this? If it says it might have it, odds are when it, for me, when it comes to peanuts, I'm not buying it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but other people, you know, maybe, maybe may not be as severe, um, allergic mm -hmm. to peanuts say as me and they may be like okay i have no problem i just want to make sure that it's actually not technically an ingredient mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it's a tough it's been a tough road to navigate right i didn't grow up with the tools in my toolbox to navigate that world um, mm -hmm. so sometimes i am a little envious of, of kids though my heart breaks for them um but they have kind of you know their parents have kind of educated them and trained them from the beginning right and they don't know what they're quite frankly they're not missing so like i said some days i'm a little jealous of the kids um because they've grown up knowing how to navigate that world and i had to figure it out in my mid-30s um, mm. very abruptly yeah and I think it's very scary as well to all of a sudden have something that you don't know how to prevent but is very deadly absolutely I mean I mm. loved peanut butter cups <laughs> <laughs> that was like one of my guilty pleasures and I suddenly like like what do you mean I can't have them anymore oh uh, what do you mean I can't eat those French fries or that chicken sandwich because they happen to be fried in peanut oil? Um, yeah, so it's been it's been really interesting, but I really have to say that, um, you know, I met my now husband in my early 40s and um, the mother of his children actually has a severe aller a food allergy, a different one. Um, but he was just like, oh, yeah, no big deal to me. Like, I've I'm accustomed to this already. Um, mm -hmm. So that was really like awesome to find someone who like understood um, and really didn't see it as a, as a big deal. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine it would be very difficult to be with someone who just didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine what that would be like because I'm not yeah. with, the, with that kind of person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so if people want to find out more about you, um, where should they go? Um, well, I am on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube under the Digital Wrangler. Um, what I share on those platforms does vary. And so if you really just want to come to my website, um, that is www.thedigitalwrangler.com. They can read more about me. Uh, they can learn some more about the digital laws out there um, and hopefully maybe be inspired to start or even continue a conversation uh, with their loved ones. Thank you. And we'll make sure that um, those links are on our show notes so people can find them easily. So thank you so much for joining me today. It was really lovely to talk about some not so lovely things. Gabriella, thank you so much. I really have enjoyed our conversation too. And, uh, and I've learned something tonight as well. So thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Room by Room, produced by the Home Organization Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and any other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, sharing, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people to find it so we can grow and continue to bring you quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, ho.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra, and thanks for tuning in.